All right, we're going to look at the book of Jude, please. Open your Bibles to the book of Jude. All right, we got the book of Jude. All right. Now, for some of you who are unfamiliar, or it's all over the news, so you probably already heard about it, concerning the case with uh, Kyle Rittenhouse, where uh, the case found him not guilty. However, the, uh, that upset it, obviously, the liberal world. And then they're trying to say, well, justice was not served, blah, blah, blah. And then if you remember about Derek Chauvin's case, where they found him guilty, and they were hoping the same case with Kyle Rittenhouse, but it didn't work that way to their favor. So the thing is, when you notice all these news about it, it's, uh, it's pretty crooked, you notice, uh, about these wicked people. The BLM rioters, it's not peaceful protests, remember that. All right? it's never, it never was a peaceful protest, no matter how much they proclaim it. Uh, there might be, to give them the benefit of the doubt, there might be some places where there were peaceful protests. I'm not saying everybody is a rioter, but that whole system and that movement with the way that they encouraged about taking more action and that we have to have a name, we have to speak out, and Maxine Waters uh, before the dreadful day saying we have to do it even more strongly, I mean, then obviously that's encouraging all kinds of bad things that could have happened. And that's the reason, and you know, if they think that, well, you're too much stretching it, well then why did they do that with Trump's case, right? Like with his tweets and stuff like that, they'll say, notice right here, he's just encouraging violence then. So, every, so basically the liberal world is full of hypocrites, all right? They're full of hypocrites, they're full of the devil. Amen. Now, if you look at some of the cases too, some of these, uh, you got to realize we're talking about, uh, a, I mean, a image, we're talking about basically, I know that the thing is this, he's not a grown adult, you have to understand. And the whole world wants to put what? This kind of pe penalty on a child, basically, a person who's not a grown adult yet and expect like full-blown punishment upon them when two years ago, they would have blamed the justice system to do that upon a, uh, a child, a person who's not a grown adult. But why would they do that? Because of their system. They have a liberal system, liberal belief. So they could care less about your age. That's how demonic these people are. They're scary now. Now they don't care anymore. Now they don't care anymore. So this is getting to a scary point. If you look at these grown adults saying, you know, that, oh, yeah, justice wasn't served and I got shot. And then you looked at some of these photos where they were, like, pulling out a gun. And then the news media pointing out a teardrop falling on that bearded grown adult's face, you know, saying, oh, I got shot and stuff like that. When he was a guy that pulled out the gun, it's full of wickedness and evil, these people. Oh, yeah. And then, you know, for him to say in the news when at the stand he confessed that, uh, yeah, the gun was pointing at him, and then all of a sudden the news, oh no, from their perspective it was, but then he just lied out of the stand then, see? Or he was lying in the stand then, under oath. But anyway, these guys are just full of the devil, full of evil, and it just, this thing you have to understand, why am I talking about this case, about... Kyle Rittenhouse. I think his last name is R-I-T-T-E-N-H-O-U-S-E. -T -T -E. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. So Kyle Rittenhouse, what will he have to play about all this stuff to commence the tribulation and the mark of the beast? It has a lot of salient things, actually, believe it or not. This case is very important. You might say, why is it important? Because just look at what the world's thinking now. What the world is thinking, and they're encouraging and they've been doing this the past five to ten years is we've got to have more gun control mm -hmm. That's it. we've got to have more gun control so you'll notice that this demonic being here he's hoarding all the guns why for the sake of what he what they would claim peace and safety it's for your peace it's for your protection I mean, it seems to make sense. The guns are the ones that kill people. So the more you take away guns, and the more that you'll protect people. No, that's stupid. I mean, think about what would have happened uh, with Kyle Rittenhouse's case. It's because of that. That's why he was saved himself, obviously. If he didn't have that, then, yeah, he would have been uh, killed. 
All right. Uh, can I have my note? Where, where, where's my note? Uh, all right. Now, guns are there for protection, especially during the riots. There were people emptying out gun stores. You might say, why? Because they were afraid of their businesses getting robbed into. I'm, I'm telling you, it's so bad that in the liberal San Francisco Bay Area, you know who are the ones that the people felt safe around? Gangsters. <laughs> gangsters. Why? To protect from rioters. And then the gangsters, they were like saying, oh, uh, the gangs, they were telling, oh, it's, it's uh, telling the cops, no, 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 this is our territory. Don't worry about us. All right, we'll take care of our neighborhood, our area. And then these stupid rioters, they didn't dare to... Uh, riot the neighborhood, or kill people over there. But this is all fulfilling scripture because of something that's very important. What it is with all of this, for some of you who don't know, is that the Antichrist, he has to control the world. Now, in order for him to control the world, there are two means to do this with gun control. There are two key things that I noticed. One is the government. The second thing is criminals. What does gun control have to do this? The people cannot protect themselves. They cannot protect themselves from a crooked government who can have more control or from even normal people out there who can commit crime. So basically they have zero protection. Now, why does the devil want to accomplish this for the Antichrist kingdom? The first one will be pretty obvious, which we might know, but the second thing will be very interesting. It's repeating a certain pattern all the way back to Genesis. All right, so let me explain. So, first of all, we're going to look at the book of Jude. It's a fulfillment of Scripture. Jude is a tribulation epistle. It is a tribulation epistle because notice some examples right here where it talks about the last days in the book of Jude, where it talks about the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, where it talks about end times. You'll notice right here, verse 14, And Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these. So he's prophesying about these issues. We'll come to those issues later. Of what? Saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment upon all and to convince all that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds which they have ungodly committed and of all their hard speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. Now notice right here that these issues Jude's talking about, he says that Enoch prophesied. So predicting the future about what? God's going to come down and send judgment on you. So see, this is tribulation context. You can see tribulation context within this chapter. You'll also notice another example of uh, tribulation end time doctrine. In uh, verse 21, keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. Verse 24, now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. So notice right here that the people are looking forward to what Jesus Christ when he comes down at the second advent to rescue them. So this is all tribulation context. There is no doubt about it. Understanding that this is a tribulation context, let's uh, look at what the verse prophesied about the issues of these people. The issues of these people are as followed in verse 8. We'll go to verse uh, 8. We'll start out from there. Likewise also these filthy dreamers defile the flesh, despise dominion, and speak evil of dignities. So it's not just government being corrupt themselves, but people who are anti-government as well. Now think of these BLM rioters, right? They speak evil 
of uh, the government that you're not doing enough. There's, there's racism all over and etc. That's why we need to do a protest because our system is messed up, they said. That's what the Bible was prophesying about these people. So it's not just more government control, it's even the other way around. See, whether you're pro-government or anti-government, the devil covers both sides somehow. That's important to understand. Look at verse 11. Woe unto them, for they have gone in the way of Cain and uh, ran greedily after the heir of Balaam for reward and perished in the gainsaying of Korah. Look at verse 9. Yet Michael the archangel, when contending with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses, durst not bring against him a railing accusation, but said, The Lord rebuke thee. So let's look at now 2 Peter. Compare this with 2 Peter. Chapter 2. 2 Peter chapter 2. The wording is the same with Jude. Jude said at verse 10, but these speak evil of those things which they know not, right? But what they know naturally as brute beasts, in those things they corrupt themselves. Jude 1.10, right? So these are people who are natural brute beasts. Look at 2 Peter 2.12. But these as what? Natural brute beasts made to be taken and destroyed speak evil of the things that they understand not. That matches with Jude, there's no doubt about it. So it's the same group of people speaking evil of government on uh, like these BLM rioters. But look at this. The Bible says at verse 10, but chiefly them that walk after the flesh in the lust of uncleanness and despise government, presumptuous are they, self-willed, they are not a afraid to speak evil of dignities. See, it's repeating, Jude. It's the same group of people, those BLM rioters. Now notice that the Bible says in verse 13, and shall receive the reward of unrighteousness as they that count it pleasure to what? Riot, Riot in the daytime. Daytime. Yeah. That's the BLM rioters right there. Spots they are and blemishes, sporting themselves with their own deceivings. Notice uh, that these people who are riots, rioters, that the Bible prophesied they would come out in the tribulation. So this happens in the tribulation. So that's why Kyle Rittenhouse case and then the BLM riots, this is all paving a way for what's going to happen in the tribulation. But the question is, why? Why would the devil do that? Because wouldn't he want more government control, right? Unless you get government and rioters working side by side together to accomplish a same evil purpose. Isn't that what happened last year and this year? Yeah. Yes, government politicians siding in with the rioters uh -huh. and the rioters siding with them. But I thought the rioters were against the government and the system, not unless the government sides with them on that one. You know what it is? It's, it's, an, it's a chaotic mindset where you don't have an organized, peaceful government set up, so you demolish that. You speak evil uh, of an organized government set up. And then what you have instead, it's replaced with a different type of government control. And you work that through the riots. What's an example of that? The communists. Yep. They start out with riots to topple their governments, but then they give more government control to those people. Why? So that you can get rid of uh, racism or unfairness or inequality. Wait a minute. That's what those communists said back then. And that's what the BLM rioters are saying. Right. You see a pattern here? They're repeating history. You see this brainwashing tactic of people thinking about inequality equals freedom, but no, it's replacing with more government control. That's right. Why? Because the New World Order setup is this. This is known throughout a lot of uh, people who studied the New World Order. The job of the globalists is to topple the current government system, and then through chaos, you bring what? A more universal, stronger type of government that they proclaim is more peaceful. Well, that sounds like the Antichrist set up what he's doing. Now, let me explain why 
uh, gun control is important to the devil. First of all is Revelation 13. Revelation 13. The reason why, think about this, what was the purpose in the Kyle Rittenhouse case, why he had a gun and all that? This uh, and everybody. The reason why people want to get guns is because of self-defense. Without a gun, then you don't have self-defense. Good luck having a knife when there are people chasing you with guns from the government, especially if it's a crooked government, right? There are many stories and cases of where certain governments have tried to uh, go into different cities or normal citizens to take more control of them, but they had a difficult time because the citizens were armed or they had guns. There are cases throughout history of that one. I think there was a case, I could be wrong, but I think there was a case about in World War II about the Axis powers. One of them just uh, left a certain uh, village or city alone because they heard about that place being armed with guns. But I don't, know if, uh, uh, I don't know if I got that story true. But the thing is this, is that the point is when you have self-defense, self-defense, then you have your own protection. And it causes certain people in power to have a more difficult time controlling you. The Antichrist's purpose is to make war. And when he makes war, he's going to conquer, actually, the saints, the Bible says. The saints are actually going to be battling out or practice self-defense, but then the Antichrist, he's actually going to, through war, conquer. Let's look at Revelation chapter 13. We're going to look at verse 7. And it was given unto him to make what? War with the saints and to overcome them. And power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. Notice that the Antichrist has more power. And then uh, because he has more power, he's able to make war. Through war, you have to have weapon and artillery. That's how the one world government is set up. That's why they want to have all the guns. Look at Revelation 6, the Antichrist, what he wants to do. Look at Revelation chapter 6. We'll look at verse 2. His purpose is to conquer and to conquer. And in order to do that, more gun control. Eventually, you can ban guns, and then etc. Revelation chapter 6, verse 2. And I saw, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given unto him, and he went forth, what? <clears throat> Conquering and to conquer. Look at Daniel 7, Daniel 7. There is no doubt about it. The Antichrist, he's going to make war. In order to have a more effective war, why not control more weapon, more artillery? Why not control it where the other side doesn't have it? <clears throat> Look at Daniel chapter 7. The Bible says at verse 25, Daniel chapter 7, and then verse 25, and he sh uh, shall speak great words against the Most High and shall what? Wear out, Wear out the saints of the Most High. Notice right here that this is uh, more so to the context of war. You're going to notice at verse 21, I beheld, and the same horn, that's the Antichrist, made what? War, war with the saints and what? Prevailed against them. So we understand why uh, this Kyle Rittenhouse case is important. Because then the people promote more gun control, the government to take more charge of the weapons. You're not taking enough charge as you should. What does that mean? That means you're giving up more of your rights, rights to bear arms, rights where they can have more control of the government. If they have more control over this and the normal people don't have it, then all you need is that one world leader to take in charge of the government. Just like this is, well, why do you doubt that? It was proven throughout history before. It was proven throughout history before with Hitler and the Nazis. It was proven before with the communists where they took care of the, uh, the normal people and took their weapons and had them for themselves and had more control over weapons. It was proven throughout history through with dictators. Why, don't, uh, why, why won't it happen in the future with the Antichrist? The devil did it before throughout previous eras. Why not again? Oh, he'll do it again. And the Antichrist, once he takes over the government, if they have all that gun control, he can successfully make war. So that's a no-brainer right there. But this is scary because the Antichrist, what does he do with the saints? He beheads them, right? 
Now people will talk about FEMA, and then these FEMA camps, they'll talk about where you'll see these machines where they're already set up to behead people in concentration camps. I don't know if you heard about that. So then because you have these uh, guillotines and then these machines set up already where you can behead people, then uh, does FEMA have that? Yeah, <laughs> that's why they would say that FEMA has these machines. So then you just put these people into concentration camps and behead them. Well, then would FEMA take more control over the guns? So this is old. This is old. It's called executive orders. We've seen plenty of that last year and this year. Yeah. All right, executive orders. That means th you notice that the people have no free will now. Why? It's done for the sake of what they call peace and safety. They say that all the time, peace and safety. All right, so then you had more government control. Now imagine to the point about government control where they promote, where they claim it's peace and safety, that's applied to the guns now. We're taking it away because of peace and safety. Well, is that true? Is that part of their executive order? Yeah, they can. It, FEMA executive orders 10990 through 11310. Let me read you something scary that you didn't know. A. States would retain only those forces, non-nuclear armaments, and establishments required for the purpose of maintaining internal order. They would also support and provide agreed manpower for a UN peace force. You know what that gobbledygook means? You know, that sounds nice, but you know what that translates to? Give all the weapons to this guy right here for the sake of peace. That's what it means. All right? So give it all to this guy. Why? For the sake of peace and safety. All right, go to 1 Thessalonians 5. The Bible already predicted this would happen in the tribulation. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 3. So they're supposed to build, uh, give the manpower to Big Gov over here. Now, keep reading. B, the UN Peace Force. That's what they call themselves. UN Peace Force. Force, isn't that interesting? The Bible says that Daniel 11, God of forces. We'll, we'll turn over there later. In the tribulation, the Antichrist is going to come out with God of forces. Interesting, they call themselves a UN Peace Force. But Peace Force, it's like they're promoting scripture. Of, yeah, so look at right here at 1 Thessalonians 5, 3. The Antichrist kingdom is what? For when they shall say what? Peace, Peace and safety. But that's today when they promoted their executive orders to take away more of the will of the people, rights of the people. Notice, then sudden destruction cometh upon them. See, then the Bible says then sudden destruction happens. Uh, go back. Go back to uh, Daniel 11. So peace force. Is that Antichrist? No, peace force is not Antichrist. Well, look, look at right here. They use the word peace. They use the word force. And they call themselves United Nations, right? All right, let's see if they just fulfilled scripture. This equals Antichrist, not good godly people, all right? Let me show you scripture. You don't believe me, all right? And they use the word united, okay? United Nations. UN Peace Force. You know what? They just, get, they just expose themselves saying, hey, we're the Antichrist. <laughs> That's what they just did. You might say, no, you're stretching it too far. No, look at it right here. Daniel 11, all right? Look how they fulfill scripture right here. They first gave away the first word, peace, right? And safety? Okay. Now, next one, Daniel chapter 11. Uh, and then notice at verse 38, this is the Antichrist when he sets up the God. But in his estate shall he honor the God of what? Forces. Forces. Okay, force, check. 
They just, uh, they just keep exposing themselves. All right, go to Zephan uh, Zephaniah. Zephaniah. Verse, chapter 3, verse 8. Zephaniah, chapter 3. We'll read verse 8. This happens in the tribulation, the future where they try to go up against God. You know what God says? Zephaniah 3, 8. Therefore, wait ye upon me, saith the Lord, until the day that I rise up to the prey, for my determination is to gather. See that? They're uniting the what? Nations. Nations that I may assemble. See, united. How about that? All right, check nations. Check united. Guess what that means? It equals this, okay? That's what we saw in Scripture. Don't get angry at me. That's Scripture. That's the book, That's the book right there. I mean, they just called themselves the UN Peace Force. They just already told you, hey, I'm Antichrist. Watch out for me. <laughs> All right. FEMA Executive Order. B, the UN Peace Force, equipped with agreed types and quantities of armaments, would be fully functioning. Oh, so they want them to fully function with this, uh, with this armory, okay? They have to be fully functioning. Of course, with peace, right? The Antichrist comes with the bow because he's peaceful, right? But he's holding a bow. Yeah. Not putting the arrow there so it's like a gun, right, to shoot. So he's not putting the arrow there. See that? I'm not shooting you. I'm for peace, but I'm just holding the weapon, the bow. <laughs> Revelation 6, that's why the Bible says he comes in with a bow. Think about that one for a while, huh? But anyway... C, the manufacture of armaments would be prohibited. Oh, so it's prohibited then to manufacture armaments. Except for those of agreed type and quantities to be used by the UN Peace Force. Wow. So you see these people, crooked people? It's forbidden to build up your weapons. Except, except, let me take all. That's, that's the devil right here. He's taking all the weapon for himself. Let me take all of it. And those required to maintain internal order. Oh, it's all done for the sake of peace. There's an Antichrist again, Revelation 6, holding a bow. See, it's peace. I'm not putting, I'm not shooting at you with an arrow. I'm just holding the weapon. It's just a bow. See that? Let me hold the bow for internal order. That's what Revelation 6 is showing you. All other armaments would be destroyed or, look at the wording here, well, look, isn't this nice? Destroyed or converted to peaceful purposes. <laughs> now, I'm, I'm reading you FEMA executive order right here. This is how they word it. You can't help but just laugh. It's scary too, isn't it? It's very scary how they call it. This is, this is known as peace. Bang! D. The peacekeeping capabilities of the United Nations would be sufficiently strong and the obligations of all states under such arrangements sufficiently far-reaching. That's like worldwide, one world. They want to make sure that they have a worldwide reach. To be strong as to assure peace and the just settlement of differences in a disarmed world <laughs> you see that that's scary stuff right there it's all just sick vomit than when you read all this stuff all they have to do is just put an executive order why for the sake of peace and safety i mean they've been successfully doing it it's a trial run what you're seeing recently they're just, uh, they're just waiting a little bit more and then they're going to make it more severe with executive orders for peace and safety. Department of State Publication 7277. All right. Now, understanding that that's the devil's purpose through big government so that he can take more control, then what's become of the tribulation saint. Go to Hebrews. Let me tell you something. Hebrews 3. Hebrews 3. Some people will uh, erroneously say that Hebrews chapter 4, 
we're going to look at Hebrews 4, that this is the gospel for saved Christians. No, you're taking away a very important gospel for tribulation timeline. Right. Now, in the tribulation timeline, God knows that this is very, very dangerous, what uh, big government's doing, the New World Order is doing. They're going to take all the weapons. So then that's the reason why God says it's so important that you have to defend yourselves. Why? Because he knows the Antichrist, he's going to make war. He's going to uh, get their families, get those people, and then take them for himself. And then they're going to suffer immense hurt and pain, and there's no safety. So God wants them to be armed. So it's called the gospel of armed warfare. You never heard of that? We believe in a doctrine called dispensationalism. In other words, we believe rightly dividing verses to the right group of people in right time period. Why? If you don't do that, you're going to combine all the verses together and come up with a horrendous wrong doctrine, like this case right here. The gospel of armed war... This is not the gospel, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Gospel means good news. That's all it means, good news. That's very obvious. I mean, here's an easy example. We, uh, you already got four Gospels, even without me pointing that out to you. What is it? The Gospel according to Ma the Gospel of Matthew, Gospel of Mark, Gospel of Luke, Gospel of John. What's that? Good news from them. Yeah. See? So it proves right here there are different Gospels. It's not one Gospel. Why? Because there are many types of different good news, obviously. Gospel mean good news. That's so important. Gospel don't mean death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. No. Gospel simply means good news. The death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ is good news. That's why it's called the gospel too, all right? That's why it's also called the gospel. But you got to realize there are many different gospels. All right. So Hebrews 3, their gospel is this. Good news is this. You have to arm yourself so that you can win against the Antichrist system. Now, notice in the previous verses, the Antichrist, he's winning against the saints. But in the end, and I'm going to show you that passage, in the end when they arm themselves, they beat the Antichrist through the Lord. That's why they have to arm themselves. Why? Because this is all for the nation of Israel. The nation of Israel... They have to prepare themselves for war because the Antichrist, his job is to annihilate them, wipe them out. If you notice, or unless you're blind and stupid, United Nations, you can see that all of, all of them, they have a tension against Israel. Oh, yeah. It's all aiming toward there. So you're seeing scripture fulfilled in front of your eyes. With United Nations taking all the weapons for themselves and then all attention aimed targeting the nation of Israel and the saints of God, See, that's what the devil wants to annihilate and wipe out. So look at Hebrews chapter 4. That's why God's saying, you got good news. You can arm yourselves. You can conquer. Hebrews 4.2. For unto us was the gospel preached, but look at this, as well as unto them, but the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. What's this gospel that's preached to them that they didn't believe? It's the Jews at verse 16. For some, when they had heard, did provoke, howbeit not all that came out of Egypt by Moses. But with whom was he grieved forty years? Was it not with them that had sin, whose carcasses fell in the wilderness? Verse 19, so we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. See, so that's the gospel that was preached to them because they didn't believe. All right, so... The children of Israel, so let's talk about the nation of Israel here. Here's some things to understand about this gospel of armed warfare, if you want to understand this dispensationally. The gospel of armed warfare, we know that it was speaking to the Jews on what? Who are trying to enter the promised land, okay? Who are trying to enter Israel, the promised land. But their problem, the, here's the negative parts, they provoked God, right? They didn't believe, right? They believed not. Now, 
Number 13, that's the story then. Scripture with scripture will show you this answer, what the Jews, uh, what incident it's talking about. Let's look at this incident Hebrews, the book of Hebrews is talking about. Look at the book of Numbers, chapter 13, Numbers chapter 13. Numbers chapter 13. Notice that the Bible says at uh, verse 27, And they told him and said, We came unto the land whither thou sentest us, and, sur and surely it floweth with milk and honey, and this is the fruit of it. See, that's the good news, right? Hebrews 3 and 4 talked about this good news was preached to these Jews, right? About entering the promised land, Canaan, right? So that's the good news about entering, the pro entering Israel, the promised land Canaan. Okay, we agree with that so far. But look at this. They uh, provoked the Lord to anger. Look at Numbers chapter 14. Numbers chapter 14. The Bible says in verse 11, And the Lord said unto Moses, How long will this people what? Provoke me. That matches. So this is Numbers 13 and 14, no doubt about it. But let's keep reading here. Keep reading. And how long it, will it be ere they what? Believe me for all the signs which I have showed among them. See, they had a problem with believing. So there's no doubt. Hebrews is talking about Numbers 13 and 14. All right? So what were they, uh, what's the good news? The good news is, if you remember, look at uh, verse uh, 7, verse 7. This is the good news. And they spake unto all the company of the children of Israel, saying, The land which we pass through to search it is an exceeding good land. If the Lord delight in us, then he will bring us into this land and give it us a land which floweth with milk and honey. Only rebel not ye against the Lord, neither fear ye the people of the land, for they are bred for us. Their what? Defense. Defense is departed from them. And the Lord is with us, fear them not. So notice right here, this is about conquering another person's defense. They were defending themselves so that they can attack against what? The defense of the enemies over there. So this is all... The good news, this is all good news, right? What is this? This is about warfare, conquering the land. That's what the gospel is. Uh, if you look, let's go back to uh, chapter 13, verse 30. 13, verse 30. The good news repeated again. And Caleb stilled the people before Moses and said, Let us go up at once and possess it. For we are well able to overcome it. See, that's the good news. We can conquer it. But, but what? Verse 31, they did not believe that good news about conquering, about armed warfare. See that? Verse 31, but the people that went up with them said, we be not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we. So we need big government to take care of us because we can't take care of ourselves and it's so dangerous for us and... Wow, wow, wow. See that? They're repeating. They're repeating history. Now, how do we know this is tribulation, though? Okay, so we do know that, go back to Hebrews. All right, go back to Hebrews. Scripture with Scripture, dispensationalism is such an interesting doctrine. For those of you who have first heard about this now online, watch our dispensationalism playlist. Amen. Watch the video. It's called Amazing Dispensational Truth from Gen from Genesis to Revelation. I even have a book on Amazon Kindle on that one, so you can get it through there too. So the thing is, if you look through these, uh, dispensationalism will open your eyes if you look through these things. It's so eye-opening. Look at Hebrews 4, verse 2. What's our first clue? This is about Jews in the tribulation. Look at the top of your book. It's titled what? Hebrews. Hebrews. Oh, okay. Now, Go back to Hebrews chapter 1, verse 2. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 2. Hath in these, what? Last days spoken unto us by his son. See, that's about the tribulation. How about that? Okay, so in the tribulation, do the Jews arm themselves? Go to Zechariah 12. Zechariah 12.
Zechariah chapter 12. Notice right here, the nations. Nations. Look at the wording right here in the King James Bible, Zechariah 12. Nations try to go against Israel, try to conquer them. But the Jews, they have to arm themselves. They're going to fight it out. They're going to war. And God's going to side with them later on at the end, and they're going to win. Yeah. All right, look at Zechariah chapter 12, verse 2. Behold, I will make Jerusalem a cup of trembling unto all the people round about, when they shall be in the what? Siege, both against Judah and against Jerusalem. See, there's a battle, war going on between them in the last days, the end times for the Jews. Look at verse 5. And the governors of Judah shall say in their heart, the inhabitants of Jerusalem shall be what? My strength in the Lord of hosts their God. See, they're encouraging themselves. They need to, good news. See, they're putting good news on them. They're, they're spreading good news to encourage themselves about what? Warfare, well, which we read at verse 2 and verse 5. Look at verse 6. In that day, after they get that good news, what happens as a result? In that day will I make the governors of Judah like an hearth of fire among the wood and like a torch of fire in a sheep, and they shall what? Devour all the people round about on the right hand and on the left, and Jerusalem shall be inhabited again in her own place, even in Jerusalem. Look at that. Jews go to Israel, just like the book of Numbers. The Jews enter Israel. God gave them that gospel. Good news. Arm yourselves. Believe in it. And they fight it out. That's why Hebrews is speaking to the Hebrews that you have to do that in the last days. That way they can win victoriously at the end. Look at verse 7. The Lord also shall save the tents of Judah first, that the glory of the house of David and the glory of the inhabitants of Jerusalem do not magnify themselves against Judah. So notice right here, God helps them win at the end. So the gospel of armed warfare. What's the point of Kyle Rittenhouse? And what's the point of the BLM riots? What's the point of gun control and then banning guns and all that? All of that has to do with attacking the gospel and I'm not talking about the gospel of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Did you, did you see Jesus die, buried, and resurrected in all these verses we looked at? No. No, it's about arming yourself, arming yourself, arming yourself. The devil not only wants to attack the gospel of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, he wants to attack the gospel of armed warfare. That's the devil's goal. That's why he's doing all of this. That's why this case is important. Why? Because if you look at the news, he became, uh, this incident became the, the stirred up anger and motivation now to push more control over the weapons. All right, now, if, look at the book of Luke. Look, the book of Luke. And we'll look at chapter 9. We're going to look at Luke chapter 9. And then we're going to look at Luke 21, Luke 9. And then we're going to look at Luke 21. I didn't know there were this many verses about gospel of armed warfare and, you know, about this gun control thing at, in the tribulation. Well, yeah, just read your Bible. That's it. Just don't read your Bible. Just read your Bible. All right. Look at the book of Luke chapter 9. And then I want you to turn to Luke chapter uh, 21, Luke chapter 21. Uh, 22, excuse me, Luke chapter 9 and Luke chapter 22. This is very interesting. Look at what the Bible says right here. So, self-defense, the right to bear arms, has been known throughout the church age as well. Now look at this. This is very eye-opening. In the church age and tribulation, both of them, okay? In the church age... And in the tribulation, the devil knows that Christians in the church age and then tribulation saints at the tribulation, that they can be armed themselves for self-defense. Uh, being filled with self-defense, Satan, he's trying to currently right now in the church age take away the right to bear arms and then eventually in the tribulation. You might say, really? Yeah, because look at this case right here. We see that with the case with Jesus Christ. Luke chapter 9 and verse 3 through 4. 
And he said unto them, Take nothing for your journey, neither staves, nor scrip, neither bread, neither money, neither have two coats apiece. And whatsoever house ye enter into, there abide, and thence depart. So notice right here, Jesus said, uh, when he, they were preaching, what? Verse 6, the gospel in the, the gospel, right? So the disciples were preaching about a certain good news before Jesus died, buried, and resurrected. So that's another different gospel, but I'm not going to cover that. If you're really interested about these gospels, dispensations, uh, watch my video, Four Gospels. It's called Four Gospels, and then you'll type my name and you'll find it. But it's fascinating. It's called the Gospel of the Kingdom. And this Gospel of the Kingdom, okay, look at this. This is very interesting stuff. We're, we're covering a lot of dispensationalism. Isn't that interesting? All right. Now, we're going to get a little deep in doctrine here. So we saw the gospel of armed warfare. Now we're going to cover the gospel of the kingdom. Now when they were preaching about the gospel of the kingdom, look what happened. They, uh, Jesus said, don't carry stave nor script nor nothing, right? This is before he died on the cross. Now look at this change at Luke 22. He had a change of mind at Luke 22. Verse 35. And he said unto them, What, uh, when I sent you without purse and scrip and shoes, lacked ye anything? And they said nothing. Wait, that matches with uh, uh, Luke 9 3, right? What he told them. So then they're spreading. Uh, let's call this spreading. When the disciples were spreading the gospel, okay, they had uh, no scrip. Uh, nor stays, bread, money. But then look at the change here. Verse 36. Then said he unto them, but now he that hath the purse, let him take it. And likewise his scrip. And he that hath no sword, let him sell his garment and buy one. Suddenly a change. So before Jesus died on the cross, great, there's no room over here. Okay, <laughs> let's... Uh, I'll just erase this one. Everyone knows this title. Okay, so let's just erase this part. That way people can look at a timeline here. I'm going to draw a timeline so you can understand. If I don't draw this timeline, it might, it might not be as eye-opening. Okay. All right. This line. All right. Now. All right. This is before, right? He died on the cross. He says nothing, right? Now that he's getting too ready to die, he says, get armed. Right? Notice that change? He changed his mind. Why? It has to do with this death. Keep reading right here. Verse 37, For I say unto you that this that is written must yet be accomplished in me. And he was reckoned among the transgressors, for the things concerning me have an end. So... Notice right here the things concerning him about being, what, crucified among the transgressors, right? That's what it says. Have an end. So the things, so Jesus' ministry here, right, the things concerning about him would end. So before he died. And when he dies, there's going to be a change. That's why he says, arm yourself. Now, why would he say that? Because before, when they were preaching the gospel of the kingdom, when they were preaching the gospel of the kingdom, they didn't arm themselves. But now, if the context of that, if the context of having nothing is spreading the gospel, then he's telling them when you're spreading the gospel, this time be armed. Why is that different? Because after he died and went to heaven, when the disciples were spreading the gospel, right? Because they spread the gospel before, but now after he died on, cross, died, after he died on the cross, they were spreading the gospel. This time they're armed. Why? Because self-defense. Uh, they're, they're going out to the Gentiles, foreign lands, where uh, circuit-riding preachers and missionaries who travel on the road, they can be robbed, they can be in danger, right? That's why they have self-defense that time. And that time, 
they were preaching about the gospel of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ during Paul. So the gospel changed to here. So now we get the Christian gospel here. Now, this is before the gospel of the kingdom, right? The gospel of the kingdom resumes here in the tribulation. And this time, when they're doing the gospel of the kingdom in the tribulation, this time they're going to be armed. Why? Because this is before Jesus' ministry. Now they're going to be armed. Why? Because of this gospel of armed warfare. Now, if you doubt me about the tribulation, look at this, okay? Look at uh, Matthew 24. Matthew 24. Matthew 24. Armed, and guess what? Th those orders did not change in the tribulation, right? So they're armed again. Before it was the gospel of the kingdom, then it went to the gospel, the Christian gospel, death, burial, resurrection of Christ. With a, with a change command, you be armed. His armed command did not change over here, but the gospel of the kingdom resumed. So isn't that interesting? The gospel of the kingdom before, it was nothing. But then in the tribulation, this time they're armed. All right, look at uh, why. Why is that? Why are they going to be armed? Because when they spread the gospel, they're going to be running for their lives. The Antichrist government and the people, they're all going to hunt them down. That's the second thing about why this part's important, the criminals or the normal people. You might say, why is that? Because what's going to happen is this. The reason why this is so important about uh, self-defense is when, you're not, when you don't have self-defense, then you're relying on the government to protect you, but what if the government's not around to protect you? Let's say you're street preaching, and you're street preaching, and then all of a sudden, then people come up with you with knives and guns all of a sudden. And then uh, you're running away for your life and then you're expecting the government to protect you, but then they're not there to protect you. So then you have no choice but to protect yourself. There are cases throughout church history, like I think it was Peter Cartwright and J. Frank Norris, and Jack Woods recently, like about maybe 50 years ago, where they would be armed themselves, where they would have guns. And they protected themselves from mobs before, actually. Uh, so that was the case. Uh, we, there are cases of that during church history. But now think about this. If, uh, if normal people and criminals, no one's keeping an eye on them, right? That's the rioters. That's why the Derek Chauvin case is so important. Why is that so important? Weak order now. When you have more weaker order, more encouraging of riots, right? In street preaching, what are you gathering? A riot or crowds of people who can do a riot against you. Now think about this. Because the police and law and order system has been weakened and have been terrified due to the Chauvin case and uh, the BLM riots, then you have no protection, no order. And then you have these people killing you on the spot and without police to protect you, guess what? There's no justice served. Guess what's going to happen in the tribulation? That's exactly what's going to happen. Right now, you're safe when you're street preaching. Right now, you're safe when you're witnessing. But the devil's goal is so that the gospel don't spread. And eventually, there's going to... Uh, so he's weakening law and order and then he's going to weaken self-defense, and then you have no protection, so then how are you going to give the gospel? So then his job is, I want you to be killed. Like randomly when you're witnessing to somebody, they just kill you on the spot. That's going to happen in the tribulation. You know that when they give the gospel, random people will kill them. No, I don't believe in that. Look at this. That's why I believe, that's why these BLM riots are important. The Chauvin case is important so that, these, that the devil can have normal people, rioters, people who are anti-government, who have no respect for the law, who could care less, to kill you. Look at Matthew 24. Look at verse 14. Uh, verse th uh, for context, this is tribulation, right? If you look at verse uh, 3, right? 
the end of the world, right? Tribulation. What's going to happen in the tribulation? Verse 14, And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in what? All the world for witness unto all nations. And then shall the end come. Look at this right here at verse 9, right? So Jesus Christ described the end at verse 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, tribulation, tribulation. Then look at all of a sudden at verse 9, what Jesus Christ describes in the tribulation when they preach the gospel. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you. And ye shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. And then shall many be offended and shall betray one another and shall hate one another. Look at that chaos. Everybody will turn against you and persecute you. Not just law and order, not just government, but people themselves. But this is more plain at Luke, if you don't believe me. Look at Luke. Luke is more plain. Your own family could even kill you. That's how chaotic it will be. Absolutely no law and order. Look at Luke, if you don't believe me. Luke. Luke chapter 21. Luke chapter 21. Notice Luke 21 is repeating Matthew 24. And you can look at that at your spare time. There's no doubt. It's repeating Matthew 24. It's the same story. But look at this, what Jesus says at verse 12. But before all these, they shall lay their hands on you and persecute you, deliver you delivering you up to the synagogues and into prisons, being brought before kings and rulers for not my name's sake. And it shall turn to you for a testimony. Uh, look at verse 16. And ye shall be betrayed both by what? Parents and brethren and kinsfolk and friends and some of you shall they cause to be put to death and ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake. See, everybody can just kill you on the spot. Imagine these riots. So that's what the devil wants. He wants these riots to grow so much to a point that the gospel is discouraged. The, gospel, the Christian gospel for today and then eventually the tribulation. That's what he wants. That's why he wants to encourage these riots. What he encourages through these riots, these riots are so important to the devil. It's so that you have no protection. And then if to gun control, then you absolutely have zero protection. Didn't you know it's really sad? There are some people and street preachers and people who have some people who guard for them so that they can keep preaching or speaking. You know that? Like, I think, like, Steve Crowder is one example. He'd have some muscle big guys over there. Why? Because people are just crazy people, once you realize. They are not loving people, peace and love. They're full of the devil. They're full of hypocrites. Look at, uh, oh, my. All right, so let's look at Re Revelation uh, Hebrews. Let's look at Hebrews. And then Genesis 9. i got to wrap this up quickly. I, I, I went too long. Okay, let's look at Hebrews 2. Hebrews 2. Let's wrap this up quickly. But I didn't tell you the big doozy, so this is the big doozy. All right, let's look at Genesis 9 and Hebrews 2. And then let me wrap up tonight's teaching. This is a lot to cover. All right, that's why th these riots are important. So I'm like wondering, okay, why are riots important uh, to the devil? Okay. So it has to do with uh, people being killed. We see that, right? So that the devil can kill people more. And I'm like, why is killing so important to Satan? Well, one, because he's, the, what, he's in charge of death. Look at Hebrews chapter 2. He's the power of death. So he wants to see more people die. Hebrews chapter 2 and then verse uh, 14. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood... He also himself likewise took part of the same, that's Jesus, that through death he might destroy him, Satan, that had the power of death, that is the what? Devil. So Satan wants to kill, all right? Now we've seen Luke and other passages. There's no doubt Satan wants to kill people. So that's the reason why he wants these riots. Why? Kill, kill, kill people. That's the reason why he wants no self-defense. Why? So that you don't save your life. You get killed. Kill, kill, kill. Why is killing important to Satan? Genesis 6. He had a kingdom before. The tribulation is not his first. He ran this before at Genesis 6. What was his... But this is so interesting, the word of God. 
Look at Genesis 6. There's something strange here. There was an agenda when Satan built up his kingdom before he built it up with the Antichrist back then. Genesis chapter 6, look at verse 13. And God said unto Noah, the end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with what? Violence. Violence. Satan, when he built up his, anti, uh, his one world government back then, right? The whole world was under his wickedness control. He filled it with violence. Now, he also filled it with sex too, right? So it's violence and sex. Sex we get, right? Because he's intermingling with uh, humans and then he's starting his own abomination. But why violence? Then it dawned on me, okay? This is eye-opening. It's not just violence, it's what? Sex too, right? Okay. What is accomplished through sex? What's accomplished through sex is that mankind, when they were originally created, think about that. Originally, mankind was created to be in whose image? God's image. Now, this is eye-opening to me. God's image is the what that fills up his creation and the world, right? Now, Satan, he hates that. Now, he succeeded in taking away the image of God, uh, the image of God through Adam's fall, but he wants it completely eradicated because originally we were created in God's image, right? So originally we were, so then he wants it completely eradicated because that's filling up his world. So it made sense to me. Why does he want that interbreeding? He wants God's image, any sign, any trace, any history, any reminder of it, replaced with his abominable image. That's why the Antichrist sets up his image. And these people worship images at the tribulation, revelation. I wonder when they worship images, they're like, I want to become like that. Then they interbreed. What does that have to do with violence? Genesis 9. God already gave you the answer at Genesis 9. And why did God give this rule at Genesis 9 after Noah's flood? When there was so much violence. Look at this one. Genesis 9. Look at uh, verse 6. Whoso sheddeth man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed. So capital punishment. He hates it when uh, a man's life is extinguished. Why? For in the image of God made he man. Why does God hate violence or killing? Because it's a reminder of what he created us originally in his image. That's why Satan wants to kill, to get rid of any history of this. That's why uh, it's so interesting. So then it makes sense. Look at Revelation 6, Revelation 6. So it makes sense. So what's his purpose? This is his ultimate agenda with everything going on with the riots, the written house case, and the weakness of law and order and protection. What is it? So that Satan can wipe out anything that reminds a history of the image of God. And he wants it all replaced with his demonic offspring. And people who have an admiration for demonic offspring and images of the Antichrist image. And then that is so, inter you're seeing it right now. When God originally made, it, made mankind, it was male and female. And right now you're seeing them trying to ruin that. Right? Like, I want to be who I want to be. 50,000 different genders, colors of the rainbow. Metaverse makes it worse. I'm not content with this. I want to become something else. See that? They're, uh, it's all of getting rid of the image of God, any trace of that. And then the real thing comes with the Antichrist. Intermingle. We get rid of any trace of God's image on my earth, and I just want my image, says the devil. You're all after my image. That's his ultimate goal. That's why he doesn't care about people dying and he sends out death and hell and his demonic horde at Revelation 6. Revelation 6, verse 8. And I looked and behold, a pale horse and his name that sat on him was death and hell followed with him. And power was given unto them over the fourth part of the earth to kill with sword and with hunger and with death 
and with the beasts of the earth. That's why he unleashes hell and wipes out a quarter of the people over there. Why? That's what he wants. He wants any sign and trace of the image of God gone. You didn't think that would be the case from such a simple case of the Rittenhouse case, right? That's where it all comes down to, see? No protection of life. Why? Because he wants any trace of God's image gone. Heavenly Father, I pray that tonight's teaching have been very eye-opening to the hearers about uh, what the devil's trying to accomplish, a deeper agenda, a dark agenda. There's no doubt about it. He's trying to revive Genesis 6, Heavenly Father. And uh, the Bible predicted riots would happen in these last days and that the government would take more control and that life would be killed. I pray that uh, all of it, the accomplishment, the agenda, the goal of BLM riots and then more government control and everything is death. That's what it all comes down to at the end, Lord. And I pray that the people will be uh, open their eyes and their hearts throughout the satanic system of this world and not fall for it. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.